Greetings, this is Dale Brown. Today we're going to be doing a study on the homosexual issue. Uh, we're going to entitle it, God's Eye on the Queer Guy. Now there's extreme views on the gay question on several fronts. Because many in the gay community are pleasant people and many of our friends may be gay, there's often a tendency to redefine the terms of morality based on our prejudice. The Bible's quoted and often misquoted to support our views. Now one of the first things that you learn in studying apologetics or defending the Bible, especially in dealing with religious cults, is they tend to redefine the terms. They actually take the English language and they redefine the language itself so that uh, they may be saying one thing and you're thinking one definition and they're thinking some other definition. Well, the same thing applies for the, the gay situation here. For example, the word gay. I mean, at one time, maybe 50 years ago or so, uh, the word gay simply mean uh, to be a kind of a happy person, you know? Whereas today, to be gay has to do with a, a sexual uh, lifestyle or preference. Now, it's one thing to uh, question the standard of the Bible as being a standard for living, but when you question and change the standard of the English language, when you can't even go to the dictionary to get a proper definition of terms, uh, we find ourselves in a, in a pretty dubious situation. Now, of course, as Christians refer to the Bible as uh, their standard, that, of course, is where we're going to have to start to uh, have some kind of bearing on what we're talking about. Now, the first reference to homosexuality in the Bible is in the book of Genesis. And due to a land dispute, Lot, Abraham's nephew had moved into the Jordan Valley near what is now the Dead Sea to a city called Sodom. Now it had a reputation of being a place full of exceeding wickedness and sinners against God. Now that's in Genesis 13 if you want to look it up and chapter 18 as well. When some neighboring kings went to war against Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot's family was taken captive. Abraham, he mustered an army and went out to rescue him. Well, the king and the priest of Salem came out and blessed Abraham after the war was all over, and the king of Sodom was grateful as well and offered to, to pay him. A few chapters later, it is revealed to Abraham by God that Sodom and Gomorrah are about to be judged for their sins. Abraham, concerned for his relatives, reasons with God about Lot and his family. Two angels are sent to deliver the message of the pending doom and to rescue Lot's family. Now, the Bible tells us that sensual and unprincipled men of Sodom surrounded Lot's house and demanded that two foreigners come out so they could have sexual relationships with him. Lot refuses to allow his guests to be mistreated, and the Sodomites make threats of what they're going to do to him. Out of desperation, Lot offers his daughters to him, and when they persist with their aggression and try breaking down the door, and they're struck with blindness, a supernatural act of God through these angels. When it becomes clear to Lot that the city of Sodom and Gomorrah are about to be toasted by God, uh, he tries to explain this to his son-in-laws and tries to encourage them to get out of town, and they don't really take him serious. Well, Lot and his wife and two daughters were ushered out of town by the angels, leaving everyone else behind. Quote, Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and the valley and all the inhabitants of the city, and what grew on the ground. That's in Genesis 19. From this story, we get the term sodomy. In Hebrew, the word Sodom simply means to be scorched, and Gomorrah means a ruined heap. It is often argued from the gay perspective that Jesus never addressed the gay issue. It is true that Jesus never addressed homosexuality directly. He did, however, allude to God's judgment on the cities of Sodom in two places. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 15, and chapter 11, verse 24. And being a Jew, he taught directly from the law of Moses. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill, he said in Matthew 5, 17. He, in fact, rebuked the religious leaders of his day on numerous occasions because they were misrepresenting the law of Moses. His remarks regarding divorce clearly indicate the biblical marriage tradition of male and female in Mark chapter 10, verses 6 through 12. Now how the law looks, that is the Mosaic law, how it looks at sexual sin is very clear. It is covered from nearly every angle in the 18th chapter of the book of Leviticus. Everything from homosexuality to sex with animals. In reference to the fruit of these heathen practices are made in this way, quote, for the men of the land who have been before you have done all these abominations and the land has become defiled. That's in Leviticus 18.27.
Now the spillover effect of sin on society is obvious. When the drunk driver kills an innocent person, we all feel the consequences emotionally, financially, insurance uh, prices reflect this. Laws are written to bring some form of order. Now God's laws are no different. If laws regarding morality and what marriage really is are tampered with and adjusted and redefined, it isn't long before there's this total social breakdown and chaos. I mean, uh, if men are allowed to marry men and women are allowed to marry women, it isn't long before, well, somebody's going to argue that they want to marry their dog or you know, they want to marry a, you know, a baby or a child or something like that or a relative, and, and it's just chaos from there on out. Now, though Jesus didn't address the homosexuality issue directly, his followers certainly did. The words of the New Testament writer were very clear, just as clear as the Old Testament. Several thousand years after the Genesis story, Peter wrote, He condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter. That's in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. Then in the little book of Jude in the New Testament, he wrote, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Apostle Paul, who was schooled under Gamaliel the high priest, knew full well the history of the Jewish tradition. In his epistle to the Romans, he spoke clearly of the principles of God's judgment on, on idolatry and sensuality. He wrote, Professing to be wise, they became fools. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their heart to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural, in the same way, also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. That's in Romans chapter 1, verses 22 through 28. Oh, but some will argue, well, isn't God a God of love? I mean, surely he wouldn't do such a nasty thing to somebody just because of their lifestyle. Well, it's true. God is a God of love. It's clear that God loves gay people. Uh, in the Bible, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The law of Moses was given as a guide to point us to Christ who can deliver us of the bondage of sin, whatever the sin is. We all have different weaknesses. Some may be of the sexual nature, others may be to alcohol or drugs or anger or maybe they have a problem stealing things or whatever. The solution is the same, the blood of Christ. Is it really loving to misrepresent the truth? Now if you had a child who was about to touch a hot stove, if you really love that child, you're going to do everything in your power to prevent the child from being burned. Well the same thing applies for humanity. Uh, if humanity is headed for judgment and be burned, uh, if we really love the people who are headed for the furnace, we ought to be doing something about it, at least warning them. And if they get upset, well, that's really too bad. I mean, uh, sometimes the truth hurts. Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, a reminder of their past and how they should act as believers. Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators or idolaters or adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. 